writer's reign for that. Alrighty. So, without further ado, I am going to get started on this do now problem. So, there's a very big, um, if you don't catch this when you're reading, then you're going to mess up the problem. Not really a trick, but something that you need to pay attention to. I said 34 kilograms. Molar mass is grams per mole. So you need to convert that 34 kilograms to grams. So we've got the average car, it can hold 34 kilograms of gas in its fuel tank. How many liters of oxygen gas are needed to fully combust, combust one tank of gas at FTP? So we've got a mass, 34 kilograms. And the question is asking how many liters, which is a volume. So this problem type is mass to volume. We have a mass, we need to figure out a volume. We good so far? Okay. Good. Now I said that we have 34 kilograms and that's gonna to need to be converted to grams when we do all of our calculations. But first let's just write out the basic steps of what do we have to do to solve this problem? The first step, we have to take our mass and convert it to mole. And that's going to use our molar mass. So what that looks like, and remember there's an extra step here, we've got 34 kilogram. This is actually the chemical formula for octane. Um, there's more than just octane and gasoline, but this is the majority of it. So just for your reference, we're going to first convert this to grams. You will need to remember how to do conversions for the final. That's why I threw this in here. You can redo this on your own time. Make sure you understand it. So we're trying to get to grams. There are 1,000 grams and 1 kilogram. Now that we're in grams, we can use our molar mass, which I calculated already. Did anybody get a molar mass for, um, for octane, C8H18? I know we were kind of talking, so we probably didn't have a whole lot of time to do the problem. I'm not going to write out how to get the molar mass, but if you're like, molar mass, what's that? Then uh, hit me up after class, <laughs> okay? So the molar mass that I calculated was 114.26 grams per mole. Now we want to get rid of grams and get to mole. So we're going to put one mole on top. Yes, question? So remember that, so we've got kilograms. So if we have one kilogram, how many grams do we have? Kilogram is bigger than a gram. So we're going big to small. If you use that chart, it'll say one times 10 to the three. 
and our exponent is going to be positive because we're going from big to small. So we're going from the, the pie, the whole pizza pie, to the number of slices. So it's going to be a bigger number. So the number you get from that conversion chart. A thousand is the same thing as one times ten to the third. You're welcome. So that's just an extra step, okay? So that gets you from kilograms to grams, and now we have to go from grams to moles. So that's our first step. I'm going to get rid of this um, over here. I need all the space. Okay. The next part we have our moles of given. Now we need to convert that to moles of unknown. So in our problem, what is unknown? Is it the gasoline or the oxygen gas? Which one are we trying to figure out a volume for? Right, oxygen gas. So that's going to go on the top of our mole ratio. And remember, that's what we're using for this step. We're using a mole ratio to get from moles of what we know about to moles of what we don't know. So in the top, we're going to put moles of oxygen. In the bottom, we're going to put moles of gasoline. And remember that this comes from the balanced equation. So we look at the equation for how much oxygen there is and it looks like there's 25 moles of oxygen in the balanced equation. Then we look for the gasoline, and there's two moles in the balanced equation. So that's our mole ratio. The final step, we have to actually answer the question. And the question is asking for how many liters. Right now, we have moles. So we have to take our moles of unknown and convert that to liters of unknown. Since we're dealing with a volume and we're dealing with moles, that means we're using molar volume. There are 22.4 liters of gas and one mole of gas at STP. You always have to see at STP. And you'll see why when we start Chapter 10. If I'm trying to, yes, so at STP, that always means that you're going to have 22.4 liters of gas for one mole. So that's what the STP is. It clues you into that. If it doesn't say that, then you're dealing with a gas law, which we haven't talked about yet. So that's Chapter 10. 
we'll probably cover maybe three or four gas laws on Thursday. And they're not, if, the math for that is a lot easier than what we're doing right now, I promise. So we need to convert to liters. Right now we're in mole. If I want liters at the end, should I put liters in the top or the bottom for my unit factor? Where do the liters go? Yes, they go at the top. So there's 22.4 liters of gas for every one mole. That's a pretty long thing, right? Pretty long equation. Put that into your calculator and see what you get. When you get something, you can put it in the chat box. Uh, it might not be wrong. Remember, we're starting with a big mass. 34 kilograms is pretty big. Just just put it out there. Yeah, so I got 83,000. Um so this type of an answer you you'd want to put in scientific notation and use two significant figures. So the calculator answer gave you something like this. There are some decimals after that, but what you want to report Two sig figs. Yeah. So that's a refresher for what we were doing last class. It takes practice. So just make sure that when you're going through that you're you're really getting it, that you're able to do the process on your own. All right, so that was our do now. Now we're gonna get started again with chapter nine. And if you have any questions about what we did, you can definitely talk to me in office hours. We just gotta finish up this chapter. There's not a whole lot left. The last two problem types are not that bad. The first one is just volume to volume. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, 1230 to 230. You're welcome. 
So volume to volume problem. Gay Lussac, he's someone who did a lot of work with gases and he has a gas law actually. What he figured out is that the volumes of gases under similar conditions, they combine in whole and small whole number ratios, just like compounds do, you know, substances like solids and liquids and stuff. So that's the law of combining volumes. Gases combine in small whole number ratios. And the way we can apply that is by looking at a balanced equation. If we have 10 milliliters of hydrogen gas and 10 milliliters of chlorine gas, we're going to make 20 milliliters of hydrogen chloride gas. So they combine. You can use the balanced equation to also talk about volume. So remember, there's an implied one there. You can also say one liter plus one liter gives you two liters of gas. Not just moles, you can also do liters, but it's only for gases. This is another depiction of that, where you're taking, you know, you've got these cute little balloons. It's the same thing. You're taking one volume of each and combining them to make two volumes. And I think it makes a little bit more sense when we do a problem. But as always, I'm going to give you the breakdown of how to do these types of problems. So this problem type, volume to volume, should be on your cheat sheet, okay? Lots of different problem types. Here, you're going to be given volumes and volumes only. So you're going to be given a, a volume of gas, and you're going to need to figure out some unknown volume of a gas. So you're going to take that volume that's given, and you can convert directly to the volumes of volume of gas unknown. And that's going to be using your mole ratio expressed in liters. So this one only has one step. It's the easiest problem type that we've done so far in Chapter 9. You can directly go. Um, so I'll give you an example because the answer is sometimes. <laughs> you have to do multiplication and division usually. So we've got how many liters of oxygen react with 37.5 liters of sulfur dioxide in the production of sulfur trioxide gas? How you identify this as volume to volume, how many liters, so that's a question mark about a volume, react with, and then you have a volume for your given information. So that's how you can identify volume to volume. All you're given is a volume and you're asked about a volume. And in this case, we've got 37.5 liters of sulfur dioxide gas. And we want to know how many liters of oxygen gas will react with it. We need a mole ratio, but instead of writing moles, we're going to write liters. So you can see this two here is two liters, one liter, two liters. We want to know more about 
the oxygen gas. So are we going to put information about the oxygen gas for our mole ratio in the top or the bottom? Yes. From the balanced equation, we see one liter. Always go to your balanced equation for your mole ratio. That means that the, the given has to go in the bottom. For that, we get two liters. This tells us the ratio of gases and how they react. So you need one liter of oxygen gas for every two liters of sulfur dioxide gas. When you put this into your calculator, you're going to multiply by one and divide by two. So you're essentially taking 37.5 and dividing it by two. That's why, Yao, I said, eh, yes, <laughs> you usually do end up having to divide, but not always. Your calculator will tell you 18.75, and don't forget your units. On the exam, you will lose points if you do not have your units. So I need to see liters of oxygen. Now, the problem gave us three sig figs. So we should report our answer with three sig figs. Okay, so you're talking about the mole ratio. All right. When we first started doing the mole ratios, we don't do we're not doing anything with molar mass. We're doing mole ratio. So we're expressing the number of moles as volume. So we're expressing it in liters. And what we normally do is you put the, the unknown, yeah, it's 37.5 divided by 2, not 3.75. So what you normally do is you put your the unknown on top and the given on the bottom, and you get those numbers from the chemical equation. So instead of writing one mole of O2, we wrote one liter because we're dealing with gases at the same um, at the same temperature and pressure and everything else, same condition. So that's it. That's volume to volume. That's the easiest problem type. We're not going to spend much time on this because I think that you, you'll get it. Um, you'll get to do one as part of your um, mini problem set for today. But what I do want to spend time on is our next topic. So we're going to move on to limiting reactants. I always teach this with the idea that you're making a grilled cheese sandwich. Oops, not one. If you're making a grilled cheese sandwich, you're going to need a couple of slices of bread. And please give me two slices of cheese. If you put one slice of cheese on your grilled cheese sandwich, you keep that to yourself. You combine those things, if you fry it up in the pan, maybe you use a little bit of butter. We're not going to add that in. It's too complicated. You make one sandwich. Everybody knows how to make a sandwich. Let's say that I had eight slices of bread. And I had four slices of cheese.
How many sandwiches can I make? If I'm using two slices of cheese because, yeah, I can only make two sandwiches. I've got all the bread in the world, but what's limiting me is the cheese. You're not good at making sandwiches. That's okay. That's all right. You still got some time to figure it out. I'm a mom. I make sandwiches almost every day. I can probably do it with my eyes closed at this point. So this is very real for me. You can only make the number of sandwiches that you have complete supplies for. Because if you hand me a, if you hand me two slices of bread and call it a sandwich. I'm going to look at you like you're crazy, and I might slap the plate out your hand. Depends on how hungry I am. Don't give me no sandwich, and it's just two slices of bread. You have to have enough cheese to fill the bread. We've only got enough cheese for two sandwiches, so that's all you can make. It's the same thing when we're talking about chemical equations and reactions. If you've got two um, two amounts of two reactants, you may not have enough to do a complete reaction of both of your reactants. There may be a little bit left over. And we can do calculations to figure out what's going to be left over. So in this case, with our cheese scenario, the limiting reactant is the cheese. And the bread is our excess reactant. Does everybody get that? That concept of a limiting reactant? So if you get lost, just think about sandwiches. Dr. Hefner will smack that plate out your hand if you ain't got no cheese. All right. So we said the limiting reactant is the one that controls the amount of product that you make. So in our example, that was the cheese. Yeah, I can go back. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. The limiting reactant controls how much product you can make. Our example was the cheese. That limiting reactant is going to get used up before everything else. And the other reactants are present in excess. So you've got more than enough bread. So I'll write it in parentheses for our, from our example. That was our bread. And this was our cheese. Let's be real. Cheese is more expensive than bread. So that will control how many sandwiches you make. There's three steps to solving a limiting reactant problem, okay? And what we're really doing is we're combining the stoichiometry problem types that we've been doing with this concept of a limiting reactant. and I abbreviate limiting reactant LR. So what you're going to do is take your reactant 1, and convert that to whatever product you're interested in. So this could be a mass-to-mass -mass problem. This could be a mass-to-volume. 
So any of the problem types that we've done, that's what it could be. Then you're going to take your reactant 2, and do the same problem type to figure out how much product you would make. Then you have to answer the question, which reactant makes the least product? So whichever one has a smaller number for the amount of product you make, that's going to be your limiting reactant. So it's a couple of extra steps. It's kind of like solving two problems just to answer one question. But if you understand how to do the stoichiometry problem, you're just going to essentially do two of those and then figure out which one makes the least amount of product to figure out which one of your reactants is limiting. I'll go on and show you a problem. We're not going to do like, you know, mass to mass or anything like that. We're going to just kind of do the idea with moles. And then you'll be able to see what I mean. So let's say that we heat up 2.50 moles of iron and 3 moles of sulfur. How many moles of iron sulfide, probably iron 2 sulfide, are formed? We now have two pieces of given information. We have information about the iron and about the sulfur. And what we want to know is how many moles of iron 2 sulfide we're going to make. We'll call this iron reactant 1, and we'll call the sulfur reactant 2. For the first one, we're trying to figure out We've got 2.5 moles of iron. How many moles of iron sulfide will we make? We need a mole ratio here. What should my mole ratio be if I'm trying to go from iron to iron 2 sulfide, what goes in the top, what goes in the bottom? And this is something that we've been doing. This isn't new. So what is my mole ratio? Ah, remember, you're not using the given information, the number of moles of each. You're using the moles that's in the balance equation. Uh-huh. So it's one mole of iron sulfide, iron 2 sulfide, for every one mole of iron. Your mole ratio always comes from the balance equation. This math is pretty easy. We don't need to pull out a calculator. Mm 
No, they are not the same. The number of moles of each reactant is different from the ratio of how many moles of iron react fully with however many moles of sulfur to create however many moles of product. So you got to keep your numbers straight. That's for reactant one. Now we have to do reactant two. We're taking three moles of sulfur and we're trying to figure out how many moles of iron two sulfide we're going to make. What is my mole ratio going to be? Remember, you're using, so not exactly. In this case, if you did that, you'd still get the right answer because the numbers work out. But the mole ratio does not have to be the same because the ratio of sulfur to iron to sulfide can be different. So our numbers are the same. It's going to be one and one again, but the units are different. Right. So if we used up reactant one completely, let me get a pointer here. If we used up reactant one completely, which is our iron, oops, y'all just let me slip. That needs an S. All right. We'd make 2.5 moles of iron two sulfide if we reacted all of the iron with excess sulfur. If we reacted all of the sulfur, the, the entire three moles of sulfur, we would make three moles of iron to sulfide. Which one of these reactants produces the least amount of product? Is it the iron or the sulfur? It's the iron. So that's our least amount of product. So that means that we're going to make 2.5 moles of iron 2 sulfide. And that iron is the limiting reagent. Does everybody understand that last step? Okay. So let's get a little bit more complicated. Now we're going to have molten iron being formed from the reaction of 25 grams of iron 2 oxide and 25 grams of aluminum. What kind of problem is this? What kind of stoichiometry problem is this? We've got 25 grams of one reactant and 25 grams of another, and we're trying to figure out how much product is made. Exactly. It's a mass to mass problem. So that means we have to do this twice. Right. We're trying to go from grams to, and when it says how much, that's always a mass. If it was a volume, it would say what volume. But if it says how much, that means we're talking about a mass. 
So the first thing we have to do is mass to mass to figure out how we go from 25 grams of iron 2 oxide to molten iron. Then you have to do another mass to mass problem to go from 25 grams of aluminum to the number of grams of molten iron. The third part is you answer the question, which reactant makes the least product? That'll tell you how much molten iron is made. So I want you to try to set up the first part here, this mass-to-mass -mass problem, to go from iron to oxide to grams of iron. I'll give you a couple of minutes, and then I'll start to set it up. And then I'll give you a couple more minutes to let you finish. I'm going to put up the equation that I have for solving the first part. I'm not going to go through all the different steps. Just going to write out at the end of the day what you should get.
so that's what you should get for the first part of the problem when you're setting it up. So if you didn't get that, this is still your chance to put that into your calculator and see what you get. Put what you get in the chat box. Are we having trouble putting it in the calculator? Uh, give me three six eggs. Okay. So, this first part, we're going from grams of iron, or iron oxide, iron 2 oxide, to moles. Okay. So, at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out how much molten iron. So, that should be your final unit, grams of iron. The first step, you're converting the grams of iron to oxide to moles of iron to oxide. This 71.845, that's the molar mass of iron to oxide. The next part, this is our, we're using our mole ratio to go from moles of iron to oxide to moles of iron. That's our mole ratio. And remember, that comes from this balanced equation. The last part, you're going from moles of iron to grams of iron. And this number on top is the molar mass of iron.
Does that help with understanding each of the different parts? It's the same thing we've been doing. Okay. So if you go through all that trouble, you should get 19.4 grams of iron. But that's only part of the problem. And that's made from the 25 grams of iron to oxide. I think I have another slide here so I can do the second part of this. Yes, I was smart. Okay, so this is only part one, okay? Now we still need to do part two. And I'll write that out for us because of the time that we don't have a lot of time. I know, I know. Limiting reactant problems take longer. You have to do multiple problems. <laughs> But take your time. I'm not going to, for the exam, I'm not going to give you 20 questions. That's just too much. These problems take time. So this part, we're doing mass to mass. We're going from the 25 grams of aluminum to the number of grams of molten iron. It's going to be set up the same way. The only difference is we're going to be using the molar mass of aluminum here. You get that from the periodic table. Then we have to do a mole to mole ratio. We need to go from moles of aluminum to moles of iron. So what should go on the top, moles of iron or moles of aluminum? Iron goes on top. So what number am I putting for iron? Right. What am I putting at the bottom? Yes, two moles of aluminum. So notice this mole ratio is different from what we just did, where we're looking at iron two oxide to iron. This time we're going from aluminum to iron and our mole ratio is different. So that goes back to, I think, yeah, you asked about this. Or someone said something about, you know, will it always, will it be the same? It's not always the same. Depends on the chemical equation. Okay, it was you. I didn't want to put it on you, but I was like, I think my brain is still working, right? The last part, we got to take our moles of iron and convert that to grams. So that's going to be exactly the same. We put the molar mass of iron on the top and one mole on the bottom. and you should get 77.6 grams of iron when you put all that into your calculator. I'll go ahead and label this again. We didn't do that because we're just dealing with aluminum and iron. The equation and in the given information is just aluminum. So we're going from liquid aluminum to liquid iron. So you don't have to add them. You're welcome. Yeah, I think your brain just exploded. <laughs> I hope you recover. All right. Okay. Cameron, now you're confused. 
talk to me about your confusion. Okay, I will label this and then you'll see. The first part, we went from grams of aluminum to moles of aluminum. We use the molar mass of aluminum. We went from moles of aluminum to moles of iron. And that's the mole ratio. And in this case, we're talking about um, iron to aluminum. Okay. I'm going to still go ahead and finish labeling this. The last part, we went from moles of iron to grams of iron. And that's the molar mass of iron. The moral of the story is you need to get comfortable with those stoichiometry problem types. Now, if you remember from the previous slide, because we're still not done, <laughs> we need to figure out how much molten iron is actually made from the combination of these two reactants with the, these different amount, amounts. So on the other slide, we said that we made 20, or we made 19.4 grams of molten iron from that iron 2 oxide. If we were to react all of the aluminum, we would make 77.6 grams of iron. So which one of these, the iron or the aluminum, produces the least amount of product. Yeah, it's going to be the iron 2 oxide. So that means iron 2 oxide is the limiting reactant. and we make 19.4 grams of molten iron. That's limiting reactant problems. They are longer. They take a little bit more time. But if you understand the mass to mass, mass to volume, and volume to volume question types, you'll be able to get this. Are there any other questions about this? So if you're struggling with this, and if the, the questions that I'm asking during the problem solving process don't make sense to you, do not sit there and just stew in it please email me, send a carrier pigeon, come to office hours, do something, smoke signals, let me know, because the exam four will be a train wreck if you can't do these problems. Chapter eight builds so that you can do chapter nine. So a lot of the things we covered in chapter eight are already being covered in the questions for chapter nine.
we didn't, we're not using Avogadro's number here for these um, limiting reactant problems, but I could. So you really need to make sure that chapter eight makes sense to you and then chapter nine. It's not too much. It's not too much. I know you can do it. You just have to take your time. You just have to take your time. Do some practice and get comfortable. Okay, I'll see you there. So 1230, give me that 15 minutes of grace so I can say hi to my kids, get some water, you know, grab a snack because it's lunchtime. And then um, we can absolutely sit down and do this. I'm going to stop recording now because it's time to have some family conversations.